Uh, Jill Mudgett is a historian who works on topics of history, identity, and place. She is from central Vermont, has a strong interest in what connects people to the lands they call home. She serves on the board of the Morristown Historical Society and the Vermont Historical Society. Tonight she's going to tell us an interesting story about difficult events in the Vermont Hills in the 19th century. Uh, thank you all for coming to our final speaker in this series. And welcome <coughs> to your budget. Thank you. So yes, I'm coming from Moyle County tonight. And, and this is a project I did before COVID. Uh, one day when I was looking for information on something else, and I stumbled upon a reference to a murder in Worcester, Vermont in 1878, and I thought, well, I don't know that murder, I've never heard of that, and I started, you know, going down the rabbit hole, which all you local historians know what that's like, and uh, became very interested in this story. So this story takes place, there's a 19th century map for you, and the story takes place right on the border of the towns of Worcester and Callis, in Washington County, Vermont. So on this map, it would be the green and then the yellow. And that area in the yellow, uh, Hawkins Pond, with that body of water, we're gonna be talking about the pond, and in particular, the ledge above the pond, which is called Hawkins Ledge, sometimes called the Eagle Ledge. So this was a really a crowdsourcing research project. I pestered anyone and everyone for help with this research. And so this is a, an acknowledgement sheet. All kinds of people answered questions, helped me out, walked me out into the woods, um, all kinds of things. So this is a scene of the murder. This is that Hawkins Pond. I took the photo in winter because the murder happened in winter when snow was on the ground. And I was really interested to see the landscape uh, in that setting. And this is a beautiful, pristine, in the middle of the woods, pond with the, the ledge behind it. And the murder happened on those ledges. So the murderer was a man named Royal Carr. And uh, the newspaper had this to say about him after the murder. He said, he is now an ignorant brute in whom the animal predominates over the intellectual, an ugly customer, an ignorant and stupid man, a brutal, underwitted fellow. So in short, Royal Carr was what today we would call mentally disabled. And he lived with relatives in Worcester uh, with one cousin, another cousin, and he also had um, a history with violence. He had committed a murder in the 1860s. This murder happens at the end of the 1870s. He had assisted in the rape and murder of a young, what we today would call a teenager, also on the Eagle Ledge Road in Worcester. Because he admitted to it, he was sent to the Windsor State Prison for 10 years, released after nine years. And when he's home after that release, he's back on the Worcester Callis border, spending half of his time with a cousin who lives in Worcester, Vermont, and half of his time with a cousin who lives in Callis. So uh, that first uh, murder, the victim was Mary Loomis. And the newspaper said, for the most beastly purpose and in the most beastly manner, the details being too revolting for publication. Uh, so a horrible murder, and actually one of the descendants of Royal Carr today is doing research to figure out exactly who this victim was, because it's not really clear in the archival record. It's a bit of a mystery. So there's a woman named Rachel Purple who lives um, on the West Coast, and she descends from the Carr family, and she's been looking into this murder. <clears throat> The victim of our murder we're talking about tonight was a man named William Wallace McCumick. So who was William Wallace McCumick? Again, according to the local newspapers, the Indian was a roving basket maker who eked out a living by fiddling, inoffensive and industrious, an athletic vagabond of magnificent physique, more than six feet tall, broad chested and straight as an arrow. So what we know from the newspaper is that he was apparently indigenous um, and he was not from around here and he played the fiddle. 
Going further, the Montpelier newspaper said, besides the girl, he brought with him a hand cart containing his housekeeping utensils, a dog, a gun, and a fiddle. And this is reported a couple of weeks after the murder. I think I may have said 1878 uh, when I started. That's wrong, 79. And this is an account out of my paper in Morrisville titled Murder in Worcester out of the Vermont Citizen. And what a lot of the Vermont papers did is they really started with the Montpelier papers that had the most detailed account, and then they would either just take fully from the Montpelier paper or offer an abridged version word for word in the Montpelier paper or sort of use the Montpelier paper as their source and rewrite it. And this is rewritten by somebody in Morrisville for the Morrisville paper. But it gives uh, the basic details of the murder. Um, and so I was interested not only in the details of the murder, but I was really interested in the landscape, the geography of the murder, because the newspaper was sort of taken with the setting. Um, and the Montpelier paper reported that it was very primitive. It was very hard to get to. Um, nobody ever went out there, they said. When they finally find the body, the uh, men folk of Tallis and Worcester go to retrieve the body and the Montpelier paper reports that a lot of those locals had never even been out there to that ledge. I'm not sure how true that is versus how much that's the Montpelier newspaper man's accounting of it, but I became really interested in getting out of the historical archives and going actually to the scene of the murder, and I needed people's help to figure that out. So the first thing I did was make contact with a woman named Cricket Smith, who's the unofficial historian of Elmore, Vermont. And we met on a beautiful fall day, and Cricket took me down into uh, what was, at the time, East Elmore, Vermont, where the victim uh, and the young woman that he was living with were living at the time of the murder. Today, this is what East Elmore looks like. It's a network of 19th century roads in the middle of the woods. Cricket knew where the cellar holes were, so that was really great. But in the 1870s, East Elmore was a thriving town with um, mills and churches and post office and schools, all kinds of things going on in East Elmore. So this is, um, the newspaper reported that at the time of the murder, the victim, William Wallace McCormick, and the young 16-year-old girl who accompanied him whose name was Hattie Kenny. She was a young white girl from the Grafton County, New Hampshire area. Um, that they had been living in the abandoned schoolhouse in East Elmore, Vermont. So the first thing I did was try to locate that schoolhouse where they were living the day of the murder. And I found this schoolhouse was just actually on Eagle Ledge Road in, was, uh, in um, Elmore, but Eagle Edge Road used to, in the 19th century, go from El Elmore, Vermont, down into Worcester, Vermont. And the murder happened just off of the Eagle Ledge Road. And this is a schoolhouse, but this is the wrong schoolhouse. This is a schoolhouse in Elmore, but not East Elmore. But as part of my research, the folks who live here invited me in and had me ring their school bell and sign the blackboard. So it was very exciting. It really was a community project. Um, so Cricket showed me the correct location. So this is, Cricket is standing behind the cellar hole of the schoolhouse where William Wallace McCormick and Hattie Kenny were staying at the time of the murder. And on this 19th century map, you see the area circled in red, has a school. That's the 1878 map. And I thought that that might be the school. That's, in fact, the replacement school. William Wallace McCormick and Hattie were living in an abandoned schoolhouse because the folks of East Elmore had just recently built a new schoolhouse. So that's the site of the new schoolhouse. And here, on the map from uh, 19 years earlier, the Walling map, you see the location of the first schoolhouse. So that's where they were living at the time of the, of the murder. So the particulars of the murder, the murder happened on a Wednesday after lunch, after dinner time, in the early afternoon, Wednesday, December 11th. As I said, there had been snow on the ground. Uh, and William Wallace McCormick and Hattie Kenny had been down into Worcester, Vermont, via the Eagle Ledge Road from East Elmore, 
to the home of a man named Chester Carr or Checked Carr and his wife, and there was at least one toddler child. And they lived in a house up off of the Eagle Ledge Road. And uh, William Wallace McCormick and Heidi Kenny had been staying with Chet Carr and family prior to the murder. And then they had gone back to the schoolhouse in East Elmore. And on the morning of the murder, on that Wednesday morning, Chet Carr and his wife and at least one child get in the wagon and go up the Eagle Ledge Road from Worcester into East Elmore back to the schoolhouse. And they ask Patty Kenny to come down and help them and stay with them. Um, one thing that the newspaper reported that they wanted from Hattie Kenny was for her to use some clairvoyant skills to help them. Uh, and so this is a 19th century thing. If you're interested in Vermont history, you may have heard of Lucy Ainsworth Cook, who coincidentally is also from Callis, totally unrelated to this story, but this is a painting of her. She goes on to have a pretty well-known career as what they call the mesmerer. Um, so if you lost your wallet, you know, might go to Lucy Ainsworth Cook. She could help you find it. Um, I'm not sure what, what Hattie Kenny, I think it was coming from Hattie, the um, clairvoyant skills, or they may have been assuming that William Wallace McCormick might have some sort of skills based on some sort of lore or notion of him as an indigenous person. I'm not quite sure, but they wanted clairvoyant help. That's one thing they wanted. The other thing they wanted was for Hattie Kenny to help Mrs. Carr with some sewing. So this is just a, a, an image of a young woman sewing. And so Hattie Kenny, it's pretty clear from the newspaper account, does not want to go back to Chet Carr's house. She doesn't want to go at all. She finally relents when she, she says, I'll go with my husband, William Wallace McCormick, will come with me. Um, and so he agrees to go, and he says, I'll take my hunting rifle, and I'll take my dog, and I'll meander through the woods from East Elmore, and I'll meet you at Chet Carr's house off Eagle Ledge Road in Worcester. You get in the wagon with Chet Carr and family, and I'll meet you at the house. So that's what they do. They leave the morning, uh, that Wednesday morning. They have lunchtime meal, dinner, uh, with the Chet Carr family, um, after which time William Wallace McCormick and another car relative depart. So we'll get to that point in a minute. But the next thing I needed to figure out was where this Czech car residence was off of the Eagle Ledge Road in Worcester, Vermont. So if you look at this map, you look at the circled red part on that pink area of the map, um, you see Worcester Pond at the bottom of the pink. That's the Eagle Ledge Road heading up into Elmore. And um, when you Today, you can only drive from the Worcester end just so far on the Eagle Ledge Road. There's a house, and then there you stop, and then it's town trails. So if you park your car and you get out and you walk, you don't have to walk very far before there's a fork in the road. And if you look at that, there's a fork on that map, and if you take the right branch of the fork, it goes up, and today it's a vast trail, snowmobile trail in the winter. There's a couple of hunting camps off of it, and their house was up there. So on that map from 1873, it says M-A and I-R Carr. That would be Martha and Ira Carr. Um, those are, that's the, the brother of Chester Carr. And so Chester Carr himself was on the town poor rolls repeatedly. He had no money whatsoever. Um, and I don't think he ever could have afforded his own property. And so I'm assuming that he was living in a property that was owned by his brother. And at the time of the murder, that man, Ira Carr, is living across the line in Callis. So the story has two properties. This is what I think of as point A. This is the departure point after they had that Wednesday afternoon meal. And after they eat, um, Cousin Royal, who spends half of his time with Chet Carr and half of his time in Callis with Ira Carr, says, he shows up and he says, hey, William Wallace, how about um, we meander over through the woods to Callis to Ira's house and you can bring your fiddle and we'll have some hard cider and we'll have a good time. Well, uh, William Wallace McCormick agrees to go, and so the two men depart after they eat that noontime meal. And the murder happens between property A and property B when they're on that ledge above that pond. So where's property B? So on this map, which was the starter image that we had, 
right above Hawkins Pond is Hawkins Ledge, and circled in red right there is a property that when this map was printed uh, belonged to Parmenter. But this is the property, it's the end of the road, this was the Ira Carr farm. And when I went out to the site, a callous man who has a long history of being on the Conservation Commission in Callis, Vermont, and grew up as a boy after his family moved to Callis, you know, exploring the woods. He remembered, not the house, the house was gone by then, but he remembered the fallen in barn. And so he was able to take me to the cellar holes of the Ira Carr house and barn. So that's, that's the destination point the day of the murder. That's property B. So the murder happened in the middle of the woods on that Wednesday in the early afternoon. William Wallace McCormick is shot multiple times with two different guns from behind. He's in front, Royal Carr is behind. Royal Carr shoots him with a pistol, with a rifle, and then shows up at cousin Ira's house in Callis by himself. He spends the night, Wednesday night, at cousin Ira's house, and he says to cousin Ira's adult son, geez, what would happen if two men went into the woods and only one man came out? And he's told, well, the one who comes out probably would have some answering to do. So he cleans his gun, um, and the next day, Thursday morning, he retraces the route, and he goes back to the scene of the murder, where he shoots the dog. William Wallace McCormick's dog had been left alone overnight with the body of William Wallace McCormick. He shoots the dog, and then he cuts some pine boughs and things, and he um, attempts to cover both bodies, the dog and the man. And after he does that, probably late Thursday morning, he shows back up in Worcester at the home of Chester Carr, cousin Chet. And Hattie Kenny is frantic. She was frantic last night when William Wallace didn't come home. She knows something is wrong. She's frantic. She tries to go and retrace the steps. She gets a little, she finds the tracks. She gets a little bit of the way in the woods and then she gets lost. She has to turn around and go back to cousin Chester's house. She tells the authorities after the murder that it was on that Thursday that both Royal Carr, who had been with William Wallace McCormick, and cousin Chet set in on her and start telling her things like, just stay with us. You know William Wallace was so handsome. You know he liked other women. You know he's gone off with another woman. Stay with us, we'll treat you better. We'll buy you some nice new clothes and, that, and, and it'll be a, a good situation. Um, when the murderer goes to trial, the, the argument of the state is that the motivation um, for the murder was to get access to Hattie Kenny, to have sexual access to Hattie Kenny, and I think that's absolutely true based on um, the record that survives, that these two car guys, Royal Car and Chet Car together, came up with this idea that if we just get rid of this man, we can have this 16-year-old girl to ourselves. So it's a story about gender, it's a story about sexual violence, it's a story about profound poverty. Uh, the Carr family, Chester in particular, very poor, um, and it's a story about this indigenous man who comes into Vermont, which we'll get into more, and his experience. So there's a lot of different pieces to this story, and you can look at what happened to Hattie, and compare that to what happened to Mary Loomis in the 1860s when she's raped and murdered on the Eagle Ledge Road. You kind of put the pieces together of sort of the unspoken hidden histories in these Vermont communities, the kinds of stories that don't get recorded, that don't get celebrated in the town histories, but that certainly happened. And when we're trying to figure out the pieces to these stories, it's often a partial history. We can't really know all of the details. Um, but you can read between the lines and um, imagine that there's just so many stories on sort of the flip side of the tourist kind of charming Vermont 19th century stories, stuff that is lo uh, largely lost to us. So Hattie's frantic all that Thursday. Um, Royal Car starts to talk, and by Friday, he spills the beans to Chester, at least according to Chester. He says, uh, Chester says that Royal came to him on Friday morning and said, you know, I've, I've killed the Indian. Um, there's some speculation that Chester uh, put Royal Carr up to this. And if you think about Royal Carr's uh, mental disability, um, it's, 
it's very plausible. Uh, so, but in any case, Chester tells the authorities, this is what Royal just told me. He just came to me. He said that he murdered William Wallace from coming. At that point, they arrest <coughs> Royal Carr on suspicion of murder, and the Worcester constable takes him to the kitchen of another man in Worcester, where he's held for the night in the kitchen, uh, which comes up in the trial because um, Royal Carr's uh, lawyer argues that the man in the kitchen sort of coerced him to confess and said, uh, you, you know, you did this, or, or pin it on your cousin Chester and say Chester um, that did it. Um, so that's part of the story, exactly what happened to Royal Carr when he's in that kitchen uh, in Worcester, Vermont. But in the, the late hours of that Friday, a group of men from Worcester and Callis go into the woods and they, by dusk, they find the body. And they decide it's getting dark and they can't remove the body. Um, they'll have to do it tomorrow morning. So the next day on that Saturday morning, there was an entourage of people, including lawyers from Montpelier and you know, uh, police people from Montpelier. And they all trek into the woods on that Saturday morning. And they retrieve the body of William Wallace McCormick um, and bring the body back to Worcester, to the church in Worcester, where today, if you're on Route 12, traveling through Worcester, headed towards Elmore, on the right-hand side, there's a town hall. And the town hall was built in 1912. Um, and on the site of that, where is now the town hall, there was a church. And so they brought the body to that church, and they performed an autopsy. And there were people from Montpelier involved in the autopsy. Uh, one of the clues they had for the murder, one of the pieces of evidence, was the snow on the ground because it snowed and then it was really warm and then it froze. So there are perfect footprints in the snow for the two men and the dog. And uh, Royal Carp, being a poor man, had patched boots. They were not in great condition and the soles of his boots had unique patches on them. So they took Royal Carr's boots with them when they went to retrieve the mur uh, body and they perfectly matched the sole of his boot with the footprints frozen in the snow. Um, and so they could see where, where the body fell, they could see where Royal proceeded alone to Cousin Ira's house, where the next day he came back. Um, so that was a, um, a big piece of evidence that they had. So I was interested, as I said, in getting out of the archives and going into the landscape and trying to figure out kind of the setting of this, this murder. So. Um, Reed Charrington here, the man on the right, he's the, the man with a lifelong history of Callis. And so we all trekked out one day with snow on the ground. We started from the Callis end and we walked on what is today a cross country ski trail for about 45 minutes until we came to that beautiful pond um, with the ledge behind it. And so on that day, I was able to locate cellar hole for destination property B. I was able to find that stuff. I was not quite sure where property A was. I knew it was on that fork of land off of the Eagle Ledge Road in Worcester. So um, on a different day, I drove up the Eagle Ledge Road as far as you could go and walked up what is used as a vast trail in the winter, and you see there, and it was a beautiful Saturday, um, and a lot, there were a lot of guys at these hunting camps. Everybody seemed to be out, and so my husband and I stopped at all of them and asked a lot of questions, and that is a ceiling of one of the um, hunting camps that I thought was really cool. So um, those guys had a lot of different maps on their walls, and they said, well, we don't really know where the property, property A is, but we know the guy in Worcester who will know, who owns that land now. So um, later on, well, we did find it. He told us uh, to go down and across the street. And so there's a photo of me staying at the back of the Czech car house. This is where William Wallace and Hattie were staying. It's where they had their noontime meal on that Wednesday, and it's where they departed from. Uh, and so we then later talked to the man who owns the property. Um, and then the, one of the questions was, what route did they take? And the folks in Worcester weren't really certain which route they would have taken. Here's two proposals for you here. The red trail from um, destination A to destination B or the purple one. And the purple one is basically right outside the doorstep of the Czech car house. And you can dip uh, in. And we thought that seemed plausible, and it may have been the route that they took, but 
uh, the guys in the hunting camp said, actually, if you go farther up the road, you can dip down in, and um, that'll take you there as well. And both of those trails will cross over Hawkins Ledge, which is the site of the murder. And so we'll never know for certain which route they took, just like we'll never know for certain what part of the ledge William Wallace was murdered on. The day we went out there uh, from the callous end with the four of us, we brought some flowers, we put some flowers on the ledge for William Wallace, but we'll never know for certain which part of the ledge uh, he was murdered on. So the next question was what happened to William Wallace McCummick's body? Um, and so I, as I said, they retrieved the body, they brought the body to the church in Worcester, an autopsy was performed, and then they held a funeral for William Wallace McCormick, at which they passed the hat around for young Hattie. And young Hattie collected some money and then went back to Grafton County, New Hampshire, to her father. Um, so I wasn't quite sure whatever happened to his body, but people in Worcester said, you need to talk to Mr. Paul White, who it was in his 90s, is in his 90s, but was for a long time the cemetery commissioner in Worcester. The great thing about the research is that unlike a lot of little Vermont towns, Worcester has pretty much only had the one cemetery, which is right along Route 12 as you're headed to Elmore. So I called Mr. White and he said, if you go back into the corner of the cemetery where the land slopes down, there are six or seven bodies buried there without any headstones, and we don't know who they are. So this um, is the cemetery. Here's more specific. Here's more specifically where the land slopes down, and I'm 100% positive this is where William Wallace McCormick is buried. I don't think at all that anybody contacted his family or anything like that, which brings me to the next piece of the research. It was really bothering me, uh, the identity of this murder victim, because Mercomic is spelled a variety of different ways, which isn't the biggest deal in the world, but I, could, I couldn't find any other reference to Mercomic, not anywhere, anything, um, and any spelling whatsoever. Uh, so it turns out that William Wallace McCormick was actually a man named William Wallace Hazard, and he was a member of the Nipmuc tribe from Connecticut and Massachusetts. And so uh, that's who he was. He was going by the name William Wallace McCormick when he was in Vermont, and we'll get to maybe why in a minute, but his real name was William Wallace Hazard. And the clue was that Young had and told the authorities after the murder that William Wallace's father was a prominent Indian doctor in Connecticut. So I looked in the census records um, for na references to Native American and physicians, and I was able to find in the 1880 census, so right after the murder, a man named Samuel Hazard, age 65, listed as Indian and physician with a wife and two young sons. If you go back 30 years, you find the same person in Massachusetts this time working as a shoemaker with a different wife and a young son named William Hazard, also listed as Indian. And if you do the math on the, the estimated age of William Wallace McCormick at time of death, and this seven-year-old boy in 1850, the math checks out for it to be the same child. Um, so why would dad have been working as a shoemaker in the 1850s? Well, it, um, by the 1850s, the Nipmuc people were starting to lose their tribal lands, which had been held under a guardianship um, with the state, and they were given an allotment of, of money and their land, and they were starting to lose that land, and they were working. And shoemaking was a common occupation for Nipmuc men as they left their tribal land and moved out through New England looking for work. So it didn't surprise me at all that, that his dad is listed as a shoemaker on the census, also, the federal census was really interested in documenting anybody um, they perceived to be indigenous. So the census enumerators were trained to list anybody as indigenous if there was if any doubt that they were indigenous. And sometimes the census records can be 
incorrect, but usually that's why historians say like, even if there's one where somebody's listed as white and we know they were indigenous, the next record is, is not going to say white uh, because there was a, it was a concerted effort to document indigeneity. So the dad is listed uh, and then 30 years later, um, he ha obviously has remarried and those would be William Wallace Mer uh, Mercomic Hazard's half brothers. And so then I tried to trace young William Wallace Hazard through the vital records that survive from that 1850 census where he's seven years old. And the next place he turns up um, is in a document from 1869 called the Earl Report. The Earl Report was commissioned by Massachusetts and it was their effort to make an accounting of the Indians who lived in Massachusetts. Make, come up with a tally, give us a number. Um, so this guy, Earl, was charged with doing that and the report was published in 1869. The Earl Report to this day is very controversial because if you're left off the Earl Report, you were left off the Earl Report. But William Wallace and his dad were not left off the Earl Report. They show up, the dad is listed. This time they're, not, they're in Massachusetts, in Worcester County. Um, and the, the dad is listed, and William Wallace is a teenager, but he's not in dad's household, but he's right after the dad's household, listed as an inmate at the um, Worcester Hospital for the Insane. So then that raises questions, what is a 16-year-old boy doing as an inmate at a hospital for the insane? And we cannot answer that question um, because A, the records don't exist, and B, if they did exist, I would not be privy to them, but I've tried to find out, and basically they don't exist. Um, people in the 19th century were institutionalized in mental institutions for all kinds of different reasons, including being caught masturbating. That was a common one. So who knows why William Wallace McCormick may have been institutionalized in his teens, uh, but here's a later photo at, from the Worcester Historical Museum of inmates at the same institution doing basket making. And we know from the Vermont report at the time of the murder that William Wallace McCormick was uh, a basket maker. So I'm not at all suggesting he learned basket making in, it, as an inmate. He may have taught basket making while institutionalized. Who knows, but there's an interesting kind of overlap there. I'm sorry, I think I gave you the wrong date for the Earl Report. It's earlier in the 1860s. Um, and then the next place that uh, William Wallace shows up is it enlisting in the Army in 1867 out of Hartford, Connecticut, listing his occupation as bootmaker. Remember his father at one time was a shoemaker. This um, kind of checks out in my mind. Also six feet tall during a time when not all American men were six feet tall. And you remember the Vermont paper talked about how tall uh, William Wallace McCormick was. So he enlists in November of 1867, and uh, by January of 1868, he has deserted. Um, so he's not, he's not in the U.S. Army for very long. But this is right after the Civil War, and if you know anything about the U.S. Army in the years right after the Civil War, you know they were out where doing what? At West Fighting Indians. At West Fighting Indians, right. So it makes a lot of sense to me that William Wallace may have not have enjoyed his enlistment and may have deserted. I've talked to some historians who specialize in army records, um, and they say that it would have been really difficult for him to have been caught uh, for deserting, um, but I do wonder if, that, if the Mercomic name is uh, an, an alias that is tied to the fact that he deserted the army. Um, so he did desert the army, and the next place he shows up is a couple of years later back in Massachusetts in a marriage record to a woman named Catherine Franklin Hamilton in, um, in western Massachusetts. And on that document, he lists his occupation as physician, just like dad, um, and his last residence as Little Rock, Arkansas. And the first time I gave this talk, somebody told me about the military fort that's a couple of hours above Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to me that he may have been stationed there and deserted from that point and went down into Little Rock. 
Um, I don't have any other information about that, however. So uh, he was at one point out in Little Rock, and then he's back in New England. Catherine Franklin Hamilton, for her part, had been married previously to a man, um, and they had several children together, and on all the census records, she's listed B for black, um, and that makes sense. She could have been black. She could have been black and indigenous because the Nipmuc people did intermarry with black New Englanders who descended from formerly enslaved people. Um, and so that wasn't entirely surprising to me. So they marry in 1870 in Western Mass. And I, and I do not know whatever happened to them. They part ways. And um, she's still alive, but, but they don't stay together for very long. <laughs> So by the time of the murder in the late 1870s, he's with Hattie from Grafton County, New Hampshire. So I was interested in following the two of them into Vermont and trying to figure out what that was all about. So I went up to the area, and this is a photo of um, Edward Hills enthroned above the clouds, which is very prominent in the Littleton Public Library, where I did a lot of research. I just threw that in there to remember to tell you about the Littleton Public Library. This has nothing to do with the research, except that it's a really cool painting. So Vermonters can pat themselves on the back because our newspaper records are so much better than New Hampshire's. They have like very, very little. I even had one day a librarian archivist um, down in, is it in Concord at the, the State Archives, bored one day looking stuff up for me, and there's just almost nothing compared to what you can get in Middlesex with our vital records. Um, so I couldn't find an, an account of William Wallace in New Hampshire. I couldn't find a good solid account of, you know, what Hattie's parents thought about this whole thing. I just couldn't find anything. Um, but what she told the authorities after the murder that gets picked up in the newspaper is that the, okay, so the murder happens in December, that back up a whole, to the start of the year, that William Wallace had arrived that January of that year. I had his dad's farm in Grafton County, New Hampshire, to work as a hired farmhand. And that by May of that year, so by spring, he and young Patty ran off together. And they told folks in Worcester and Callis that they were married um, in, in Newberry, Vermont, right across the river. And there is no marriage record. I do not think they ever actually did get married. That's the story that they told people in Worcester. So according to the newspaper account, after they married in Newberry, Vermont, they spent that summer working on the on the farm of a hobby gentleman farmer named Mr. Phelps from Boston. So the town clerk in Brookfield. And so the town clerk and I spent a lot of time looking for Phelps, Phillips, any name that might sound like that, any wealthy Bostonian who had a hobby farm in, maybe it wasn't even Brookfield, maybe it was a nearby town, and it's just the sort of thing that can make you nuts. And it's, you can't, there's no, there's no answer, there's no explanation. I can't tell you exactly where William Wallace and Hattie spent that summer before his murder, but they were in Vermont. By fall, the newspaper says when he's killed, hey, anybody who served in the legislature in the last session knows William Wallace because he was at the state house selling his baskets. Okay, so then you have to ask, well, when did the legislature meet? Now the legislature meets in the winter, but um, then the legislature met in October and November. So we know that by October and November, they're in Montpelier. William Wallace is selling baskets to Vermont politicians. I do not know where they were sleeping. Um, and this is a picture of a Nipmuc style basket. It's in the collection of the Connecticut Historical Society. And you can see it has the stamped stencil pattern. Um, and so I'm assuming that William Wallace made baskets in that style. You know, my mind can really run wild and imagine that there's a Vermont family today with a basket like that that's come down through the family because great-great-grandpa served in the legislature in that session and bought a basket from one of laws. I mean, who knows? You'll never be able to solve any of this stuff. Um, but those are what the Nipmuc baskets traditionally look like. You also remember that first account that he was in Vermont with his wagon, his gun, his dog, his cooking utensils, and it makes you wonder, did he bring basket-making supplies 
into Vermont? Or, I think more plausibly, did he gather basket making supplies in a place like Brookfield, Vermont, when he's working on the farm of a Bostonian gentleman farmer? And did he use Vermont materials to make knit muck style baskets? Really interesting, I don't know. We don't have any, any answers. But I did work with uh, Martha Hazard Small, the family historian of the Hazard family, and she sent me this reference from the Montpelier paper, The Green Mountain Freeman of 1878. Um, and this is about a guy, George Hazard, and it's very, written in typical, very racist language. It's about an elderly black man who falls off a wagon, there's dialect in there. But for me, it raises a really interesting question. In the fall of the murder year, William Wallace is in Montpelier, and so is this man, George Hazard. If you had met William Wallace on the street, you may have thought, oh, that man looks indigenous. You may have thought, oh, that man looks black because of the intermarriage of the Nipmuc people with uh, black New Englanders. So did, and the hazards are sort of all kind of related. Uh, so did these guys know each other beforehand? Is George Hazard part of the reason that William Wallace Hazard ends up in Vermont in the first place? Um, did they not know each other, but did they bump into each other on the streets of Montpelier and start talking and realize, oh my God, we're like second cousins, third cousins. I mean, who knows? Um, but this is a, just these little, these little references that you find that you can't really piece together an answer. Um, so I also wanted to answer for myself what happened to our murderer, Royal Carr. And so what happened to him is um, after the murder, and I know I've flip flopped the years and having like an issue. It's 1878, so in December 1878, and he's, he's arrested on suspicion, brought to the house in Worcester. Once they find the body and they know that he murdered William Wallace McCormick, they take Royal Carr into Montpelier and he's held in the jail in Montpelier for a long time. The trial is going on. While he's in jail in Montpelier, he starts to tell his uh, jail mates interesting stories that William Wallace comes to him in his dreams, that William Wallace tells him, don't worry, I'm not mad at you. I, I, I know Chester put you up to it. It's not your fault. To me, this raises questions, A, about Royal Carr's mental state, but also about Royal Carr as a white New Englander having like, um, understanding, false understandings of indigenous people and like, you know, spirits and things that the spirit of this dead man that he murdered comes to him in the jail and speaks to him and, you know, lets him off the hook and I'm not really mad at you, don't worry. So it's an uh, interesting story. So that after he's in Montpelier for a long time um, and then after the trial, he's sent back to the Windsor State Prison where he spent time for the first murder, where he hangs by the neck until dead in April of 1881. So he hanged for the crime. Nobody, uh, none of the family came to the event. None of the family came to retrieve his body. So that means that Royal Carr's body was buried in the prison cemetery. They used to put bodies on the prison grounds, but right before this happened, they had purchased a plot in a cemetery in Windsor. And it is not that old one right on the main drive in Windsor. It is not that easy to find old cemetery. It is, you would never find it. And um, this man who has since died uh, was a volunteer at the Precision Museum. And he met me um, and took me to this cemetery. And we drove, it's up in, up in a hill. We drove all around the cemetery. And once you see the prison uh, plot, you can't miss it because it doesn't look like anything else in the cemetery. It has all these little white metal crosses that probably were put up at the same time. So after the 1881 hanging of Royal Carr, and uh, we looked three or four times at every plaque on every metal cross looking for the name Royal Carr. It's not to be found. I wouldn't be surprised if there are people buried there who got lost in the records and they don't necessarily have a, a cross, an individual cross for themselves. But I did find this cross for Truman Gar, who dies in the prison in the early 20th century um, and no one came for his body either and so he's buried in the prison plot. Does anyone want to take a guess at who Truman Gar was? It's a typo. His name was Truman Carr. 
the much younger half-brother of Royal Carr, who was arrested for, um, the newspaper said, brutally stabbing and mutilating a cow in a field in East Elmore, which today is the middle of the woods, and he was deemed to be a danger to himself and the community, and he was brought to the Windsor prison where he lived out the rest of his life. So um, that's what happened to Royal's ha uh, half-brother, but not to Royal himself, but Royal himself uh, died in the Windsor prison, and I'm certain is, is buried in that plot in that cemetery in Windsor, Vermont. And so that's sort of, those are sort of all the different pieces of the puzzle that I tried to fit together. Um, and that's a final picture of the ledge on a sunny summer day, the scene of William Wallace McCormick Hazard's murder. Um, and I can try to answer any questions you may have, or I may not be able to answer your questions. Yes. So this is a question from a lawyer. Are you able to access the trial transcripts? Is that yeah, they're at the state archives. Did you? Did you I'm, yes, I'm I did. I did. Um, I was the there, that the chest that Chester put him well, up to it, okay. and you know, in the defense of the defense, what did Chester do within days of the murder of William Wallace Hazard? He skedaddled over the border to Quebec. And the way the newspaper reported it, it's like he's gone missing in Quebec. But you can find him in the vital records. He's just right there. Like, you could spit from Vermont over at Chester, but he's not coming back into Vermont. Um, he eventually does later in life, and his kids do. And there are people in Vermont today who descend from Chester Carr. But, uh, yeah, so did Chester put Royal up to it? I would, I, my money's on Chester. Yeah. And that was what the defense said. How did you ever name, the hazard name, to William Wallace. How did that happen? Well, I did it a little bit backwards because I, I wasn't careful enough with the newspaper databases. The newspaper never picks up on the true identity of William Wallace McCormick until the spring, I guess the spring of 81, right before Royal hangs for the crime. Um, they go back and they, they interview Hattie one more time. And it's when they interview her that last time, and she's been back on the farm with her parents for a couple of years, she says, uh, you know, A, we were never married, and B, by the way, his real name was Hazard. And if I had found that first, it would save me a lot of time. I did it, I did it the long way, and I, I went by what Hattie told the press. That, dad, that William Wallace's dad was a prominent Indian physician from Connecticut. And I said, I'm going to take her at her word that it didn't get jumbled in the newspaper and that she wasn't telling a fib, and I'm going to look that up. And when I found the man, uh, the, the dad with the last name Hazard, Samuel Hazard, and then I found him in 1850 with a young son named William Hazard, and the age was correct, I just I knew it was the right person. And then months later, I found it. It was only the one. It was a it was a newspaper out of Boston that reported that, and the Vermont Press never picked it up. And so, as far as I know, there was never a uh, printing in any Vermont paper of the true identity of William Wallace McCormick. So that all of the local historians over the years who've done little paragraphs on this murder have identified him as William Wallace McCormick, and nobody's ever called him Hazard because the Boston Press published it, and it's almost like. The Vermonters were bored with the story by then, and they just didn't pick it up. So, yes? Did you ever find out what town in uh, Grafton County had it came from? Yes, Lisbon and Lyman, both. I think, I think her dad was in Lyman. Yeah, Lyman, New Hampshire. Yeah, but there's nothing. There's like no, and the problem, and Hattie was an only child, so it's not like I could track, and she never had any children. She did remarry, she never had any children. So it's not like I could track down the descendants of Hattie and say, you know, your great-great-grandmother was at one point with this man, do you know anything about it? Uh, and so and she's an only child, so she doesn't have any siblings, so I can't track their lines. If you go back to her parents, I'm forgetting now what it is, but they don't come from very big families either. I think they were, and I think it's like her mom had a cousin who had a bunch of kids, 
And I did. I, I did, you know, Ancestry.com, and I built out these trees, and I would pick the one alive today with the most unique name, and I'd look them up on Facebook and message them. You know, hey, your great-great-great-grandfather had a sister, and the sister had a kid, and the kid ran off with this guy, Wayne Wallace, you know, and he found him. Yeah, no. So, you know, I, I, I put an advertisement in the Grafton County newspaper, and I talked to the historical society over there, um, and it was just dead, it's dead ends. You know, so all the things you think about that drive you nuts, like, what if they ever had their photograph taken together? What if there's a photo of the two of them, you know, somewhere that either, you know, got thrown out or it's in a box somewhere and nobody knows who it is. And yeah, there's a lot of, when you're doing this kind of research with people who are kind of forgotten, you, you, you're you never going to be able to have all the answers. So it can be frustrating. How long did it take to, how long was the process? Oh, it fits and starts over the course of a year, I think. I didn't do it full time or anything. Um, yeah, and it was all like right before COVID hit. Um, yeah, so that I could, you know, go out and meet people and go into their hunting camps and ask them questions. Maybe, maybe you said this at the beginning, but how, how did you get, what? What got you interested in this? Uh, I was looking for, I, I had a reference to a different indigenous topic in Vermont, and I was looking for information on that topic. So I think I was in a newspaper database just doing word searches like indigenous or Indian, and I came across this reference to this murder. And I grew up in Washington County, so Worcester's not that far away, and I thought, I don't remember ever hearing the story of this murder. What's this murder all about? And there are, the murder is in the Worcester history that was published oh, eight or so years ago. There's an account of both of the murders that Royal Carr was involved in. And the uh, murder is discussed in, uh, by Wes Kate in the Callus history that Wes wrote in the 1980s, maybe. He doesn't say much about it, but that is where I learned that when they find the body, the town fathers of Callis and Worcester are bickering over where the body is located, you know, because the town is responsible for the charges. And they finally determined that uh, William Wallace's body is in Worcester, not in Callis. And so, uh, no, I'm sorry, in Callis, not in Worcester. And so the town of Callis pays for the burial plot in Worcester. They pay for a um, hearse to carry the body. They pay for a coffin and a burial robe. Uh, and yeah, so that came from Wes uh, Kate's book, and those documents are in the Callis Town Clerk's office. About that, I think it was like two dollars. The cemetery plot was very inexpensive. I think it was, it was just a couple of dollars. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so Hattie goes home to mom and dad. And within a couple of years, she marries a man, and they're married for a really long time. And there's a vague reference in one vital record to a stillborn child, but only one reference. Um, they never have any living children. Um, and I couldn't find any other references to back up a stillborn child. And they are, when they're older, I want to say it's when she's in her 50s. There's a hired farmhand working for them, living with them. He's much younger, and she runs off with him. She leaves her husband for him, and, um, and he outlives her. And, and I tracked his people, too. Like, your great-great-uncle was married to this woman, Hattie. When she died, what happened to all her stuff? I don't know. I don't even know who that is. You know, but you got to think like if there was something special that she had from William Wallace that she wanted to keep, some sort of keepsake, she would have kept it and had it when she died. And then her much younger um, second husband disposed of her belongings. I mean, I don't know. Where did she die? Uh, somewhere in New Hampshire, in that new area in New Hampshire, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. Yes. I'm just saying the demographics of that area. How many men and wives were there? And was this all recorded? Meaning that Royal didn't have a wife, or? Well, 
your hypothesis for murder was to have access to a woman. Right. And oh, and, and Chester did have a wife. At, at least one, and the records refer to the newspaper often refers to her as, as his common law wife. And uh, yeah, I think that Chester was a bad guy, maybe. And um, yeah, he did. He was with a woman, and there was at least one toddler child in that house. Uh, yeah, but did he want to rape and claim for himself this young sixteen-year-old? Yeah, and what was his common law wife or wife uh, in an abusive situation where she was not going to be able to do anything about it? Probably. Um, yeah, but in terms of the statistics about how many single men were in, uh, we could look that up, but I don't want to answer that. But that's not relevant if, in fact, the culprit was had Yes, he did, and he did have a wife. And she's in the wagon that Wednesday morning when they go to get Hattie and ask her to come and do sewing. She's in the wagon. Um, and when Hattie's sleeping in the house, you know, those first two nights when Wayne Wallace doesn't come back, the newspaper says they all sleep in the kitchen and there are two cots in the kitchen and it's just everybody's in. And if you go to the cellar hole, it's much smaller than it looks from the photo. It's like very small. And there's, if you walk out, walk out what would have been the front door, there's like a drop off. Um, so it's, it's not farmable, it's rocky. Um, we're talking about people who really lived on the margins of society. Yeah. Yes, right? Can you surmise that Chester may have been involved with the first murder of rape people? He may have been, although the victim was a Loomis and um, Royal Car held down the young girl, and the man who raped her was also a Loomis. And the newspaper reported that what, that it was her brother-in-law, but um, the family member who's doing the research now suspects that it may have actually been her husband himself. Uh, so it, that Chester wasn't really involved in that murder, as far as we know. Uh, when they asked Chester, or when they asked Royal rather, the day that he hangs, um, if he knows why this is being, why this is happening to him. He says, um, yes, it's because of the two women. So I think in his mind, he's thinking of, uh, he's thinking of Mary Loomis, and then also, you know, he's thinking what he did to William Wallace because of Hattie, I think. Um, but there's another account when he, according to Chester anyway, when he tells Chester that he's done something to William Wallace McCormick, he makes some reference to, well, you know I've killed three times before. And that's how the newspaper reports it. There's no, we don't know if, if, if uh, William Wallace was the fourth person that Royal Carr had ever killed. We don't know who, the, and we know that Mary Loomis was the one. We don't know who the other two would be. So that's either just something that Chester told the authorities or something that Royal said and it doesn't make any sense. Or, you know, he killed other people who fell through the cracks and we don't even know about it. I mean, I don't know. Did you have I, I was just curious, it's a little off the subject, but the demographics at that time must have been uh, pretty skewed because so many young men were killed in the, in the war. That, and, and what happened in the war is that units in the army were made of all the people from the same village. Right. So there are some villages in Vermont where all the men were killed, basically. Yeah. And so I just wondered whether there was, if that had any effect or whether what the kind of milieu <laughs> was at that time. I, I don't know. That's a really interesting question. I don't, and I don't know very much about Worcester, Vermont in the Civil War and the death rate or anything like that. Yeah, but that's a really good point because certainly the people who served did know each other. Yeah, um, and this is 10 plus years, 13 years after the war. Um, I'm not sure, that's a really interesting question. There's certainly enough like men in town who are probably older to didn't go to the war. You know, the constable, the, the town leaders, there are certainly people around. Yeah, most of all, been, been all the war. Been, been a little older, maybe, yeah. That's that's interesting. I think I'll, I'll look I'll look into that. I don't know. That's really a good question. Yes. The photograph was very telling. Do you think the conviction would have happened? 
Oh, of the boots. That's, I'm sorry, that's just a stock picture of a, of a boot. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so one of the things I looked into when I was doing the research is uh, was I was looking for physical evidence that would have been used in the trial. I fantasized that there must be an archival box somewhere at the state archives with like, uh, you know, TV. Yeah, on TV, that's the way it is on TV. Why would it be that way? Because, you know, in the descriptions of killing William Wallace McCormick, he's wearing a chamois shirt, which is really interesting detail. And I think if I'm remembering, it was like um, garnet color. And there's a piece of fabric that they find in the snow. So where's that piece of fabric? Like, where's the boot with the funny mended sole? Um, another piece of evidence was that uh, cousin Ira Carr, the guy over at Callis, has an adult son named Jed Carr, or Jedediah Carr, and he subscribed to a newspaper. And I don't know if you've ever seen old newspapers, but they often have the, the subscriber's name in cursive at the top. Um, and so Royal, days before the murder, had asked Jed Carr for some gun laud, and Jed Carr ripped off a piece of paper, newspaper and said, sure, here you go. And so um, it was a little 12-year-old boy, the son of one of the leaders of Worcester who went out that day to find the body. The little 12-year-old finds in the snow this rolled up piece of newspaper and he unrolls it and it's like singed on heart, but he unrolls it. And at the top, it says Jed Carr. You know, and Jed Carr had given Royal Carr some gun laws. So that's another piece of evidence in the trial. So where is that little balled up piece of paper? <laughs> Why isn't it at the state archives? I don't understand this. Um, yeah. And I, and, I, and I don't know, you know, I would love to know the name of that dog. You don't know the name of the dog or what the dog looks like. Um, I've seen one reference, I think, to a hound dog. I mean, I'm sure it was a mixed breed dog. I wish I knew the dog's name, but they I don't. They didn't mention that they brought the dog. And they did not mention. I've never seen a record. Like, did they just leave the dog in the woods? Probably. Yeah, I don't know. And, and didn't Hattie, who knew the truth about his identity, don't you think she would have tried to contact Dad, the Indian doctor in Connecticut, and say, you know, just for your knowledge, your son was murdered in Mr. Vermont. Did she ever do that? I don't know if she ever did that. We, we won't, we just can't know that. It seems like the decent thing to do, but maybe she, maybe she never told me. Maybe they, for the rest of their lives, never, because a Hazard family historian had no idea what ever happened to the man in William Wallace Hazard. He's just gone from the records. So, and I said, well, I think I know. I think he was murdered and he's buried in Mr. Vermont. And that's not anything that was passed down to the family, which suggests that the family never got the news, right? Yeah. Well, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.